Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Oxentenko from the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology here at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today I'm here to tell you about some key points for the upcoming article we have in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, November 2011, the title of which is Clinical Pearls in Gastroenterology 2011, along with my co-authors Dr. John Bundrick and Dr. Scott Litton. These pearls are distinctly different from those that we published in 2009 and represent some advances that have come across in gastroenterology and routine clinical practice over the last few years. The first case that I want to discuss is a young woman with a history of underlying Crohn's disease who is going to be starting on infliximab or an anti-TNF agent within the next several weeks. The important part of this case is this is a woman who really ought to have screening or evaluation for inactive or chronic hepatitis B infection. There have been case reports of reactivation of hepatitis B with agents such as rituximab, chemotherapy, or infliximab, and really likely any of the monoclonal antibodies or anti-TNF agents are likely going to put a, a patient at risk of reactivation of hepatitis B. When you have a patient that's going to be starting on one of these uh, agents, it's really recommended that hepatitis B serologies be evaluated. If someone is found to be positive for hepatitis B surface antigen, they really ought to be treated with an antiviral agent during the course of their chemotherapy or immunosuppression and have that antiviral agent continued for up to six months after the discontinuation of that immunosuppression or chemotherapy. If someone is found to be positive for core or surface antibody and the latter is not from a prior hepatitis B vaccination, then they ought to have their hepatitis B DNA levels checked every three months while they're on chemotherapy or immunosuppression and be treated if that DNA level becomes detectable. So the important point here is really to make sure that in these patients that we're subjecting to chemotherapy or any of these newer immunomodulator or immunosuppressive agents that we really ought to screen them for chronic or uh, inactive hepatitis B infection. This first case ties in very nicely with one of the other cases that we present in this article as well. And the important uh, aspect in an patient such as this one I first presented who's undergoing immunosuppression with either an immunomodulator agent such as azathioprine, methotrexate, or an anti-TNF agent such as infliximab or adalimumab they really ought to have a thorough evaluation of their uh, vaccination status prior to ever beginning these immunosuppressive agents. This really falls even outside of the realm of gastroenterology and applies to other practices such as rheumatology where these agents are used as well. It's really important that we review a patient's vaccination status months before they're going to start the immunosuppressive agent if we have the benefit of that time. It's important in these patients that we screen them for hepatitis A and B, and if they're not immune, that we consider vaccination of those two viruses. All of these patients should receive yearly influenza vaccination unless they have a contraindication against that. And it's really important if they are immunosuppressed or are going to be undergoing immunosuppression that they receive the inactivated or injectable vaccination rather than the live nasal influenza vaccine. Also in these patients, we recommend that they get a pneumococcal vaccine regardless of their age, and then if they're still immunosuppressed in five years, that they receive another booster for the pneumococcal vaccine. A really important point is that if, pa if, if a patient is on chronic immunosuppression with chronic steroids or one of these agents that I mentioned, that they not receive any of the live vaccinations, such as the nasal influenza, MMR vaccine, or varicella or zoster vaccine. The next case that I want to discuss is a patient who undergoes an EGD to screen for Barrett's esophagus and in the setting of that EGD is found to have several polyps in the stomach which are deemed to be cystic fundic gland polyps. Cystic fundic gland polyps are the most common form of gastric polyps representing over 50% of the polyp types that we see in the stomach. These really occur in three scenarios. The first one, and by far and away the most common one, is the sporadic occurrence of these polyps. In this setting, there is really almost no malignant potential, and so if you find these polyps and they've been sampled, there's really no follow-up required, and the patient does not need to have a repeat EGD for full removal of all of the polyps that were seen. 
These are often multiple in nature, so again, as long as they've had some representative sampling at some point, no further follow-up is required. These polyps also can occur in, associ in association with proton pump inhibitor use. However, even if a patient has fundic gland polyps and they're on PPI therapy, there's really no role for stopping the PPI therapy unless the polyps have caused a complication such as bleeding, in which case the PPI use could be discontinued, in which case there may be some regression in size of the polyps. But again, this would not be required for all patients on PPI therapy who have these polyp types. The third clinical scenario where these polyps could occur is in the setting of familial adenomatous polyposis syndrome, or FAP. In this setting, if you see a young patient, let's say less than 40 years of age, who has numerous cystic fundic gland polyps, it's important to consider having that patient undergo a colonoscopy to evaluate for FAP. This should be considered even if they don't have a family history of FAP, given 20 to 25% of patients with FAP may have a de novo mutation and not occur in the traditional autosomal dominant fashion. So again, to highlight, by far and away, the majority of patients with cystic fundic gland polyps do not require any clinical follow-up for these polyps outside of familial syndromes such as FAP. The last case that I want to describe is a case of a young gentleman who comes in and presents with uh, GI bleeding and is found to have a duodenal ulcer. At the time of his endoscopy, in addition to the duodenal ulcer, he has gastric biopsies to evaluate for Helicobacter pylori infection. Helicobacter pylori is not found, but instead he's found to have chronic active gastritis. This patient denied any NSAID use or aspirin use and does report a similar history in the past of similar clinical features. The important point in this case is that there are certain scenarios such as GI bleeding or the presence of antibiotic therapy, proton pump inhibitor therapy, or bismuth, all of which can affect some of the testing that we do for Helicobacter pylori infection. Namely, histology, urea breath test, and stool antigen all can be affected to some degree by bleeding or one of these medications that I mentioned. If you have a case, like in this case I presented, where you have a patient with very strong suggestion of Helicobacter pylori infection, and in this case it's the presence of a duodenal ulcer and the presence of chronic active gastritis, both which are highly associated with Helicobacter pylori infection. In that case, if you have a strong suspicion but your first test for Helicobacter pylori infection is negative, it really behooves you to do a second test to more definitively rule out that infection, given the false negatives you can see in these certain scenarios. We hope you benefited from this presentation based on the content of Mayo Clinic proceedings. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you're interested in more information about Mayo Clinic Proceedings, visit our website at www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find additional videos on our YouTube channel, and you can follow us on Twitter. For more information on healthcare at Mayo Clinic, please visit www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.